Hey there, welcome in to another edition of What Barry's Talking About from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely. On this week's program, Mayor Alex Nuttall fills in the blanks on what the city is doing and not doing in terms of the homeless. We talk with a woman who was homeless, who thinks there was some merit in the bylaws the city had proposed and have been sent back to staff for further consideration. The Simcoe Hotel gets another rebirth, a new restaurant opening July 1st. We talk with the owner about his hopes for the iconic building. But first, the city of Barrie was the talk of the country leading up to what was supposed to be a vote on a set of comprehensive and controversial bylaws to rein in the homeless situation. The bylaws were never put to a vote thanks to a last-minute agreement between the city and the Busby Center in terms of where it provides food for the homeless. Barrie 360's Ian McLennan spoke with Mayor Alex Nuttall about the bylaws, the arrangement with the Busby Center, and where things go from here. There was a number of items, of course, and the focus, though, a lot of it was on bylaws that were going to be amended. That has been sent back to city staff for another look. Since your news conference, um, people have been pointing to a bylaw from 2011 that also indicated a ban of distributions of food and other items, didn't reference tents or tarps, except for municipally, federally, provincially funded organizations, any registered charity or individual that was giving out uh, food or otherwise would not be in contravention of the bylaw. Now we're at 2023. The amendments uh, took away some of that. And some are saying the council lied or, you know, they weren't being upfront about what was in the 2011 bylaw. Can you maybe sort piecemeal through this to explain it? Yeah. So so first of all, council doesn't doesn't write bylaws and we certainly don't uh, interpret them. Uh, that That's done by legal staff and uh, clerk's office staff, etc. And so I, I think uh, what what we we're trying to achieve, and we end up achieving at the end of the day on on Wednesday, was that our our social service agencies don't go to you know the same park areas or parking lots for parks where you have kids and families going to play. And the spirit catcher and, was and the, the one you catcher, were mentioning. Yeah, the spirit catcher is one that we've been asking to to have change for a while now, right? So if you can imagine if there are you know food distribution and harm reduction kits being handed out at the same places where you have. Uh, kids going to play. It's, it's it's just not the right atmosphere, both of those things to happen at the same time in the same place. And so uh, we've been working through that. And finally, by the end of the day on Wednesday, uh, that was agreed upon in partnership with uh, the Busby Center, uh, which allowed for us to then be able to say, okay, uh, we don't need to amend the, mo- the, the bills that were being uh, brought forward on Wednesday night. We could actually send them back to staff to, to make sure that all of the, it was dealt with in, in the right way. And so our goal was actually to have the agencies be regulated on the where uh, they are providing those services. Uh, and I think that that ended up being achieved without having to uh, actually approve the bill on Wednesday night. Uh, with regards to uh, some of the concern language, I think it was around individuals. You know, our, our staff, and the individuals who wrote the uh, bylaws with relation to to the agencies being allowed to do it through a notwithstanding clause uh, have actually uh, told us that that what they were looking for when they wrote that was that the agencies would be able to do it and individuals on behalf of those agencies would be able to do it but they had left the 2003 uh, language in place with regards to to individuals not being allowed to on their own go out and uh, provide these type of services in the community and so I, I think that that will be now amended permanently and we'll almost see a flip in the sense that uh, we, we, you know, the agencies have agreed not to now go to to our parks and to our waterfront to so uh, city property to do this exactly uh, and and I think there's still some opportunity for city property I just don't not in our parks and waterfront okay. uh, right and at the same time we'll now be able to amend the language from 2000 and Three or two or whatever it I was. Two thousand eleven was last one that we the, saw here. The the previous yes. bill though before that was that 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 was uh, amended in two thousand eleven with the notwithstanding had uh, identified that uh, individuals wouldn't be able to neither would social service agencies in eleven it was updated to allow social service agencies and so I think it, the right thing was done in terms of sending it back to staff to to come back with a I think a more more direct understanding of what uh, the bill meant, of what's incorporated and what's not incorporated, and ensuring that individuals are allowed to do what they uh, want to do, which is help those individuals in the community that are hurting. Was it poorly communicated by the city? Because there seemed to be a lot of uh, different interpret. Even the, I mean, a few folks were having trouble interpreting it. The public sure was too. 
Yeah, I think that's probably a little fair uh, in the sense that when uh, a bylaw is being, being brought forward, it gets uh, sent out to uh, the public through a package. And that uh, that's the agenda for the for the Wednesday nights. And council doesn't have an opportunity to influence what's in that until Wednesday night council. And so, you know, I think from our standpoint, council took our uh, the steps at the first possible opportunity to correct uh, what we were what we were seeing and hearing from the public. And uh, and I think at the end of the day, the the right thing was done, right? And at the same time, we also achieved the objective of trying to make sure that these social service agencies are providing their very important programming just in, in a place that doesn't interfere with that, with that family atmosphere. So uh, when city staff uh, takes a look again at, at this bylaw and if it's amended, um, I guess the public wants to know, um, Jack and Jill, um, if they want to distribute a tent to somebody on Duckworth Street or maybe they're in St. Vincent Park, will that be allowed? As it said in 2011, um, though they don't mention tents and tarps, that they would not be in contravention of any, of any bylaw. So, so I, I don't believe that the bylaw coming back will include individuals. So you, when you say Jack and Jill, I assume that's not an organization uh, or agency. And, I, and quite frankly, I'm not even sure it's required to have the agencies in there anymore, just based on the uh, agreed upon changes from, uh, from the agencies. So I'll, I'll wait to see what comes back from, from our, our public servants again. Uh, but I, I think that uh, when it comes to council, we'll be able to uh, again, work through it. And, you know, we had amendments that were ready to go on Wednesday night to allow individuals uh, to to do that work that you're talking about, but decided that it was actually better to send it back to staff and get a wholesale look at it rather than trying to piecemeal wording on the floor regarding how a did bylaw. You, how did you interpret the bylaw? I know, because again, that's the focal point. Um, did you interpret it be that if Mayor Lytle, I would not be able to hand out a couple of granola bars or soup to somebody sitting on the corner on Dunlop Street who wasn't panhandling. They were just holding a sign. How did, was, would that have been your interpretation? I can't do that anymore? Well, I think at first it wasn't, but once I started seeing some of the uh, information coming in from members of the community, I think that a lot of this has to do with the fact that we need to make sure that uh, it's clear, right? There's clarity in what is being proposed and what is not. And unfortunately, when you get into the legalese of bills, uh, sometimes it becomes a complicated as we saw in the original 03 and then 11 changes and then uh, even even our changes uh, that were being proposed this week uh, but but more than anything I think that um, once once those items started being uh, uh, brought up and highlighted for me I looked at it and thought yeah I can see what everyone's uh, uh, who's who's been writing in this is talking about let's make sure that we we get this right because you know, it's, it's a law, right? You, you, you want to make sure that it's done right. And uh, I think that we'll see that happen through through the process with staff. Did you expect the blowback that went uh, national from various agencies, you know, that what what was being proposed or amended was, uh, in their opinion, yeah. a violation of uh, human rights and how, how you felt? Well, it's interesting. Like, uh, I think that the, the uh, conversations that we've been having are about a safe community. It's about how do we make sure that there is a place that uh, folks can be helped, that there's a compassionate approach, that uh, individuals are uh, not left uh, on their own who are experiencing you know, mental health addictions, homelessness, and, and other items. At the same time, how do we have a safe community for uh, our young people and uh, our families? And, uh, so, you know, some of it I think was, uh, was a little bit, uh, uh, surprising, but I think for the most part, it was kind of understood there was going to be some discomfort with, with changes. Change is always difficult. And if you look at it, we know what's been going on for the last decade hasn't, hasn't worked, right? Like it's, it's getting worse and it's not just a barrier issue. Like this is a Ontario and Canada issue, right? And so, uh, we need to make sure that we're both we're both helping these individuals as well as uh, we are providing those safe spaces, safe public spaces for families and kids to be able to to use the splash pad, you know, to use the splash park without you know being 150 meters from from activities that we wouldn't want around uh, our children. And it's, and it's it's interesting, like you know, as you as you as you look around the city and you say, okay, all the organizations are doing such incredible work, and they are. But there's some gaps. There's some holes, right? And uh, some of it is a hole in the clock, we call it, right? In the sense that there's not round-the-clock services available, which there, therefore you end up having those who are vulnerable 
uh, spill out onto the streets. And some of it's a hole in the actual services, like the heating warming center, uh, sorry, the heating cooling center, uh, as well as the food programs that the Salvation Army aren't able to provide anymore. And those are things that we have now uh, stepped up and we're going to uh, bring to the table, ensure that, that, that they are providing our community because they have been gaps, they haven't been dealt with. And uh, once we're able to actually put those in place, I think they're very positive. And the province, you've you put the onus on the province too in terms of stepping up to the plate for more treatment access because you say holes, there are huge holes in the system for people that want to access the system and can't. Well, we're asking Queen's Park to come up with funding for a multitude of services, whether it's the uh, RAM service, which is rapid access response uh, to uh, the detox services to full on uh, rehab services in our community. I think it's all of these things, when you bring them together, uh, will work to create a better situation for the individual struggling uh, when it comes to addiction to mental health, but at the same time uh, provides a way forward for the city as a whole in the sense that uh, if we have these services in place, it becomes a lot easier for our agencies to be able to refer them in going forward. Still much to be done on this, including a public consultation meeting in September, a chance for residents and special interest groups to weigh in with ideas to ease the homeless crunch and revive the downtown. Ian also had the opportunity to speak with a woman outside City Hall the night the bylaw vote was to have taken place. Maria is from Newfoundland, moved to Barrie to be close to her children, has experienced homelessness firsthand and paints a picture for us of what that's like. She also comments on the bylaws the city had been considering, the good and the bad in her eyes. I was homeless uh, from 2021 and I was recently housed just past October. Here in Derry you were homeless? Or yes. Okay. What was that experience like? Uh, well, I now suffer from PTSD because, uh, you know, I've gotten to see a lot of horrible things happen to people, people that I deeply care about and people being mistreated, you know, and I've lost loved ones when we were out and about. And, also in the shelters, like during COVID and stuff like that. And then um, what was really hard was when uh, they cut the funding to the travel lodge because for a time I was there and then all of us, our heads were on the chopping block. There was only 25 houses, uh, 20, sorry, 25 spots in the E-Fry. Yep. And um, there was like almost 100 women and almost 100 men. So when the and we were told the funding was cut, and we have basically a couple months, and we don't know yeah. who's was getting year, a bed. Yeah. Was the, um, the fact the city's bylaw suggests that you can't give food or water to someone who's homeless, and not just within a park, but that street there, because they manage the street. What is, how do you feel? Do you feel angry? What are your emotions? Um, I feel hurt because uh, what were you doing last Thanksgiving? Because I could tell you last Thanksgiving... I was sleeping in the CMHA parking lot, and, uh, you know, I was at rock bottom. One of my tents had just been slashed. You know, I had tents before, and, you know, I had basically all my stuff stolen, so all I had was a couple moldy blankets, and I was given gifts. I had somebody from the CMHA walk up to me and give me a sleeping bag out of their trunk, and someone else gave me another sleeping bag. Other yeah, people walked up to me and they gave me, you That's know, pop and things. Nice. And I thought that if somebody was to try to give them a fine for giving me those little things that kept me going, because it was raining the Thanksgiving weekend, and I would have froze to death and the public and starved. Kind of you have had support from the public who've come and given you stuff and assistance? Yes. If it were not for the staff that were supporting me, and if it were not for the generous people of the public, I would not have survived. And if it were not for my homeless comrades, I don't like what they're saying. Like, I acknowledge the city's motion, like, that they're, uh, I, like, I support the positive things that they're doing, looking for more funding. That's great. But it's not necessary to prohibit charity. It's not necessary to prohibit uh, people giving what they can do with their money. And it's not necessary to prohibit giving out tents and shelter because if they actually get all these positive things funded, there's a reduced need. And also if they fix the housing, like the affordable housing pro problem, there's a reduced need for people to panhandle, for people to have charity, because more people will be housed. And the thing is, the fact of the matter is, even if they have all these services, 
Is he still rolling? Okay, even if they have all of these things, the positive things in the motion passed, there are some people who are incapable mentally and physically of seeking these services out, and it is their right to survive, and charity is their only means of survival. Again, a long way to go in solving the homeless situation in Barrie and finding ways to make things work for everyone in the meantime. What Barry's Talking About is a weekly podcast featuring the best Barry and Simcoe County have to offer and more. We've covered a lot of ground since we began last summer, introduced you to Canadian singer-songwriter Elijah Woods, met eight-year-old Morgan Mansfield, who's trying to save the monarch butterfly, and helped a local group find storage space for items collected to help Ukrainian refugees who have made the Barry area their new home. You can get caught up and make it easy to keep up in the future by subscribing to What Barry's Talking About through any streaming service. Still to come on What Barry's Talking About, everything old is new again at the Simcoe Hotel in downtown Barry. Now this. Our community rocks. It's a well-known fact blood transfusion saves lives. It's also a well-known fact that the world relies on voluntary unpaid donations to fill the need for blood. The need for blood never ends. Canadian Blood Services in Barrie is calling on you to help save a life. Please consider donating today. Appointments are mandatory and must be booked in advance. Book today at blood.ca through the Give Blood app or by calling 1-888-2-DONATE. Our community rocks on Barrie's Rock Station. Rock 95. This is what Barry's talking about from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely. It oversees the five points in downtown Barry, has fed and entertained many over the years, and is set to feed and entertain more with the return of the Simcoe Hotel Saloon and Eatery. We took the Barry 360 microphone to the Simcoe last week while work continued on the inside and got the grand plan from owner Matthew Metzler. Originally, they were thinking about cutting the, this area into uh, three separate units. And so we started brainstorming on what would be the highest and best use here. And we said, you know what, why don't we bring back the old Simcoe? Everybody seemed to love it, an iconic building. Uh, we've had an overwhelming amount of support from the community. Uh, just about every day we get somebody coming and knocking on the front door, asking if we're open and we'll tell us stories about, I had my first beer here 45 years <laughs> ago type of thing. Yeah. Really cool. So you have a really vested interest in this place. Did I read somewhere or hear somewhere there's some family history too? Uh, so well, my contractor actually, so my contractor's grandmother used to work here. She worked here, it's his great grandmother actually, and she worked here in the 1940s. They owned a gas station in town and then uh, they ended up, she ended up working here as well, um, getting through uh, you know the tough times back then. And so yeah, she was a bartender here. What's the grand plan? You're bringing back the old Simcoe. What does that mean? What does that entail? There's a lot of factors. We, we really want to bring in influences from around Simcoe County. Uh, but we do want to still keep our food at a very high level. Uh, a lot of our food is local. Our meat is local. Uh, our produce as well. Uh, we're looking into getting, uh, we're trying to pick up an 11-acre plot right now. We can grow our own vegetables, our own spices. You know, we'd love to be able to do uh, bring our produce costs down. We could do a $3 salad with maybe a wine pairing for lunch. Um, be interesting. But overall, the goal here is we really want to inc- improve this downtown corridor. I'm in love with the city of Barrie. I think it's absolutely phenomenal uh, with the lake and everything like that and the people and the history here. So we really want to preserve that. Uh, We do want to do some improvements to the outside of the building as time goes on. And um, yeah, we really just want to bring back that that old flair. A lot of history in this building. Tons. Can you go back and take us through some of it? I know I was in here a few years ago and somebody took me on a tour in the basement and there were were tree trunks holding up parts of the building. Tree trunks. Some of them are still charred from the original fire. I was originally built in the 1850s and then uh, burned down, I believe, in 1867. It was rebuilt the same year and they kept the original foundation. Um, There's rumors that it was this building was uh, part of the Underground Railroad. Supposedly, I've never seen it myself, but um, guys before me have told me that there's an actual tunnel that runs underneath Dunlop Street. used to be there. It was closed off, connecting all the buildings. So just a huge amount of history here. Uh, originally, you know, it was a, a military port, I believe. Uh, so there would have been farmers drinking here, ranchers, military guys, and uh, it's got a history for it. Yeah, uh, I heard too that there might be a ghost or two wandering around. They say there's a ghost or two. People say there's a, a couple of ghosts. Uh, if you go down to the basement, it can be a little spooky. There was there was a lady who passed away on the stairs way back, a uh, hundred plus years ago. Um, they say that she's in this place. I've been in here late at night, 
And sometimes there is a door over on the side here that goes to the upstairs uh, rooms there. And sometimes you'll hear people coming in and out of there, but it'll echo through the building. And you're sitting here going, is somebody in here with me? <laughs> it's kind of spooky when you're in a place like this. I bet. Yeah. yeah. What kind of clientele are you looking for? It's, it's gone through a lot of different machinations over the years, yep. and you think you've got the right recipe this time. Our target that we're going for is, is going to be a 35 plus, so 35 up to 75, that kind of an age group. Really want to, we want to bring in the people that have a history with this place, maybe came here 25 years ago and absolutely love the place. One of the taglines that we're playing with here is uh, continuously historic. So our story's still being written here. But we want to bring in those people that have a history here, that love Barry, and they want to have some great food and, you know, a nice, beautiful steak. Come on in here. Enjoy some good times with us. And Target is July 1st opening? July 1st opening. We look forward to that steak. Beautiful. Come on in. And that's our program for this week. Thanks to Ian for his input, to Matt Ladder for his technical expertise, and to you for listening. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to what Barry's talking about. Rate it. Review it. You can also keep up with what Barry's talking about on Facebook and Twitter at Barry360, on our website, Barry360.com, and on our daily Kickstart podcast, available from any streaming service, and on our website. I'm Dan Blake. Hope you'll join us again next week. 